When anesthesiologists um, administer anesthesia, you have a person in the loop, so to speak. The person, the anesthesiologist sees the patient, sees the responses to the drugs, decides to give more, decides to give less, decides to turn the drugs up, decides to turn the drugs down. At the end of the case, decides um, when to start turning the drugs back so that the patient can wake up. What's very interesting about the way anesthesia is done is we administer a wide range of drugs from about four, three or four different drug classes. So maybe inhaled drugs like the ether anesthetics and including nitrous oxide, which is an ether, but is also an inhaled drugs. Drugs to treat pain, primarily opioids, narcotics. Drugs which induce unconsciousness like propofol, perhaps atomidate, maybe in the past the barbiturates. And we use combinations of these drugs to produce the anesthetic state. We administer them to actively to keep the patient in the state. However, when we're done, we decide based on our understanding of the patient, how long the surgery's gone on, how to turn them off, and we let the patient recover passively. That is, we let the patient emerge. We let the effects of the drugs wear off. Thinking about the future, what if we were to reanimate the brain? What if we were to turn it back on? What if we were to administer a drug or a set of drugs which we turned the brain off, we held it off, what if we administered a drug that would turn it back on? So we've been studying that. My colleague Ken Salt at Mass General Hospital has done a series of experiments over the last few years which show that this is a highly feasible idea. In particular, what he's done is he's taken rats and shown that you can anesthetize them with the standard drugs that we use in humans, the ether anesthetics, propofol, and you can administer, believe it or not, Ritalin, the same drug which is used to treat um, ADHD, and it will induce emergence from anesthesia. And it's a very, very robust finding. Now, why is this? Okay. The brain has a co collection of networks, and one of the most important networks are what are called the arousal networks, which come primarily from the lower part of the brain, the brainstem, and go up to the thalamus and up to the cortex. Right? One of the important arousal pathways is the dopamine pathway, which comes from the, the midbrain, the ventral tegmental area, goes through the hippocampus area for memory, the nucleus accumbens area for reward, and then goes on up to the cortex. Right? Now, normally we think about this pathway here as being important for cognition. We think about it being important for reward. But because it releases dopamine, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, this is one of the major arousal circuits, it has the potential to be an area that can be exploited for arousal. So when you give dopamine, excuse me, when you give uh, uh, Ritalin, methylphenidate, the chemical name, it actually goes to the dopamine terminals in the cortex and blocks the reuptake of dopamine. So the dopamine, which is there, stays on the, at the excitatory synapses longer. So it creates, a, it creates an arousal response. It actually causes a, a waking up, if you would. Right? So to study this, Ken did this in rats. And then in addition, he went in and gave drugs which were very, very, even more specific for dopamine than Ritalin, like D1 or dopamine 1 agonists, and got the same very profound effect. And then he went a step further. He actually took an electrical probe placed it in the ventral tegmental area, in the region which is known to release, which is known to produce dopamine, and actually electrically stimulate it, and the animal wakes up. With the anesthesia still running, right? So if you think about it, the anesthesia is here creating inhibition. You administer the dopamine, and that creates excitation, which overrides the inhibition and allows the brain to come to. Now, this is good for a number of reasons. So first of all, if you had a patient who had a delayed awakening, you'd have a way of helping them come out of anesthesia. There's another practical thing that we learn from this. One of the first things that happens is the animal starts to breathe very rapidly. Right? And this could be quite a good thing, because imagine you have a patient who isn't under anesthesia, but who comes in the emergency room with a drug overdose. So maybe what you do is you administer a drug like intravenous Ritalin, you help them come to, maybe come out of their drug-induced coma, 
but most importantly, you keep them breathing on their own. Because one of the most important things for um, helping, help preventing their care from being very, very expensive is keeping them from being intubated and placed in the intensive care unit. But if they can still be awake and breathing without being in the intensive care unit, that could be a real benefit. The other thing is, this particular pathway is important for cognitive function. And one of the things we're very concerned about in elderly patients after anesthesia is their brains don't work that the same way. They tend to be more likely to be delirious or have brain dysfunction, which is called cognitive dysfunction, for periods of maybe a few days, even up to several months after anesthesia. There are many confounds, perhaps the effect of the surgery, perhaps the illness that brought them to the hospital in the first place, but nevertheless, there's seemingly a role of the anesthesia. And if this could be mitigated by administering a drug which helped reactivate this pathway, that would be a, that would be a very, very good thing. So we're studying this in detail, and we just got approval to start clinical trials of this in humans. So that's an idea for the future, but maybe even the very, very near future. It's very clear that you can turn the brain off and keep it off with anesthesia, but it's also very clear to us that you can maybe bring, turn the brain back on and maybe help restore its function more rapidly once the anesthesia is over. So the other part of it is, I mean, think of what's the ideal anesthetic. The ideal anesthetic is you're awake, you're placed under anesthesia, you're held there for precisely the amount of time that you need to be, and then you're brought out. And you're brought out, you're nice and comfortable, your head is clear, and you're ready to go to the recovery room without any side effects, all right? Many times, anesthesia is required for long periods of time, several hours. So in those cases, why not build a control system to administer to help the anesthesiologist out? Like an autopilot, for example, all right? If a pilot were flying from here to Tokyo, once the plane is up in the air, the pilot would never think about keeping hands on the controls the whole time. You'd turn the plane over to the autopilot. So we've been studying this, others have as well, but we've been studying it in detail in the last couple of years to develop a way to keep the brain precisely in a state of anesthesia for the duration of the time that's needed. And what we did is we studied not in the operating room first, but we studied in rats who, and we created a state of medical coma. So medical coma is a, is a therapeutically induced coma when patients have head injuries, maybe they have swelling in the brain, and you need to allow the swelling to come down, or a patient has uncontrolled seizures, and you give the anesthetic to help arrest the seizures in the patients that have uncontrollable epilepsy. Well, they're placed in the intensive care unit for a series of two, three, four, maybe even five to seven days on an anesthetic infusion to create this state of medical coma. Well, if you're going to be on an anesthetic for days, maybe a controller could help you do it better. So what we've been able to show recently is that you can precisely control that level of coma by, in a very simple system. You measure the EEG in the rat, you analyze it in real time, you feed it back to the controller, the controller changes the effusion pump every second and maintains a very, very precise state. So one of the things that we want to do is now study this in humans for the case of the medical coma, and then from there go on to controlling the brain of patients having anesthesia for surgical purposes. I presented this as kind of a way of the future, but is it really new? I mean, is the idea of giving a drug to, as an antidote to counteract a, uh, an effect, something which is really new or has it been around for a while? So it's been around for a while. We use, anecdote, we use antidotes all the time. So if you take a narcotic, you've had an overdose, you give a drug like naloxone in order to help block those effects, right? For example, if a patient is anticoagulated, meaning the blood is being thinned, we can give medications which will reverse the effect of the anticoagulant. So the concept of giving a drug that has an effect and giving a drug to block it has been around for years, right? But what is new, or what we're suggesting is new, is that approach is not used for creating the anesthetic state in patients. Now, ironically, in veterinary medicine, it is. So when horses, for example, go for horse surgery, they're given anesthetics, 
and they use drugs which are like the dexmedetomidine, which is a drug that um, creates oscillations in the brain very, very similar to those that we see in sleep. Um, you also can give a drug that reverses those effects, altopamazole. So in some sense, we're kind of taking a page out of the veterinary medicine book. Um, but you can see how, in the case of human anesthesia, we've gotten into a practice. Um, it's developed a lot empirically. You feel comfortable with the practice. Maybe you're reluctant to try to innovate because you're developed it empirically and maybe not always because of a deep scientific understanding. And so this is where we see a deep scientific understanding points to something which is obvious in the field of veterinary medicine that we're not using in human medicine. So let me just draw an analogy between what I'm talking about when uh, I mentioned um, administering dopamine, or in this case Ritalin, is, is effectively administering dopamine to the brain or increasing the brain's dopamine levels to come out of anesthesia and something we do every day. So we wake up in the morning, most of us drink coffee in some form or another to help us wake up. It's exactly the same thing. It is a stimulant and it helps us, it increases our arousal level. And that's precisely what we're proposing to do here with dopamine. And then once you say that, you realize that drugs in this class, or maybe drugs that are yet to be discovered or designed, could be an effective way to enhance arousal and induce emergence from anesthesia. The way I see this for the future is that the perfect anesthetic, that's what we're after, something which places you in this state of unconsciousness and you're insate, insensate to pain, you form no memories, and then as soon as you're done, we administer something which brings you rapidly out, and then your head is clear, you feel no pain, and during the time when you were here, the reason that we can do that is we're precisely controlling your anesthetic state because we're recording it, we're understanding your brain waves and using that to dose the drugs in a very, very precise manner so, you, manner so that you get only what you need and you don't get what you don't need, reducing the side effects and having your brain and all your senses be as, as intact as they possibly can be.